Hey, what's up? Welcome to United Online. My name is Lucas. We are in a brand new message series called Influencer, talking about how we are influenced by our screens. Enjoy today's message. It's so good to be in the house tonight. I'm so excited, man. There's like a million of you guys. Like everybody came out tonight. So good. Yeah. Man, I'm just so excited to bring the words tonight. But before I do anything, I just have to give honor where honor is due. Pastor Lucas, thank you for all that you do for us, for investing into me, for investing into this youth. Man, we just love you so much. Um, so tonight we're going to be introducing to you guys a new series called Influencer. And so we're going to be leaving our sex series and we're going to be talking about this. And just a shout out to everybody who was involved with that. Pastor Lucas, Lexi, Elijah, our sex experts, and Pastor Mike. Just so good to bring light to that area. So good. So as we were talking about what we wanted to do with this series uh, we kind of talked about, you know, what influences us as believers, and especially young believers. So we were talking about, you know, our peers and social media and things like that. But as I was preparing my message, I really felt like God put it on my heart to talk about how we are influencers in Christ. And that can be a little bit weird sometimes because, like, when I hear the word influencer, I think of somebody who has platform. I think of a, a social media influencer or an athlete or a politician or somebody like that. I don't think of somebody like me that maybe just has a few friends that I just hang out with and, you know, share Jesus with. But God really just started to work on me and, and kind of show me that my identity is influencer and I have influence over people around me, even if it's just a small sphere. So to do this, to, to kind of look into what we are as influencers in the Bible, I'm going to be focusing on two scripture verses or sections tonight. And this is going to be very Pastor Juan S. But if you could flip to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It is the first gospel. And uh, so we're going to be there. We're going to start there in Matthew chapter 5. And then we're also going to be in John chapter 4, John is the fourth book in the New Testament and the fourth gospel. So again, that's John chapter 4. If you could put your ribbon in John chapter 4, and then we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5. So I'm going to, yeah, Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to start in verse 13, talking about salt and light. This is a metaphor that Jesus used to kind of explain how we're supposed to have influence. And it says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And nor do people put a light, put a, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others. Let your love for others shine. Let how you influence and your kindness shine for everybody to see so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word tonight. I pray that you would just be all over this word, that these words that I would speak would be your words and not my own, and that each student would, and everybody under the sound of my voice would receive these words with an open heart and a receptive mind, and that we would respond to this word by being doers of the word and not just listeners. And in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 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 So like I was saying earlier, I feel like a lot of us believe, like if I were to ask the question, do you believe that you're influential? A lot of you probably would say, you know, not really. Because we think of what culture has defined influence as, as somebody who has platform. But that's not exactly what Jesus says. And, and as I was thinking about this message, and as I was thinking, man, like, why am I here? 
Like, how am I here in VCC Coitsville preaching to 7th through 12th graders on a Wednesday night instead of, I'm a 22-year-old, I'm in college, why am I not out doing life the way I want to do it? Why am I not partying? Why am I not doing these things? And I began to think about the people in my life that were influential over me. And one of those people is Pastor Michael Jurgen. Pastor Mike is our children's pastor. What a man of God. Yeah, give it up for Pastor Mike. He's amazing. Preached a couple weeks ago here. He really is. He's awesome. If you haven't met Pastor Mike yet, you need to. He's so good. But Pastor Mike was my gap pastor. And so in fifth and sixth grade, I went and he would pastor me. And it might surprise you guys, but I cannot remember a single word that he ever preached. Other than two weeks ago on the sex series, which is so good. But other than that, I can't remember a single message that he preached. Yet he had massive impact on my life. One of the reasons I'm here is because of that man. And the way he did that is I remember he would would invite me and some friends over on Saturday nights. My brother would go with me, Cam, and we would just hang out. We would play ping pong and video games and be obnoxious and annoying because that's what 11 and 12-year-olds do, and we would talk about the hottest girls in Gap, and it was just weird, but that's what we would do at Pastor Mike's house. And it might have seemed like kind of like small and insignificant, but man, that like uh, had an effect on me. Because why would Pastor Mike, as a young 20-some-year-old, invite me to his house on a Saturday night instead of going out with his friends and just focus on me and just have fun with me? He showed that he cared about me. And as he was just, you know, showing me that he cared about me, he would speak into my life. He would tell me, Austin, you're a world changer. Austin, you're meant for more. Austin, your life is meant to do something. And I believed him. And I walk in that. I'm walking in that today because of what Pastor Mike did. I'm preaching a sermon to you guys because he sowed seeds in the dark when nobody was looking and made me feel like I mattered. And today, I, he, this is like reaping the fruit of what he sowed, this message. Yeah. <laughs> another message that, or another story that came to mind was actually um, one of part of my family history. Um, just to give you a little snippet of my family history, you know, it's not the prettiest. Um, My great-grandfather was actually a a pretty messed up dude. Um, We actually believe that he murdered his younger brother to get the land that my grandfather owns now. He would beat his wife, he would beat his kids, he was a pretty messed up dude. Um, Obviously didn't believe in Jesus, but his wife did. My great-grandma Connie. And my great-grandma Connie decided despite her circumstance, like I cannot imagine how she felt being beat and just having to be a mom and just like all of her energy and just, man, that's, that's like, like a messed up situation. But she decided despite her circumstances, that would not control the way that she raised her children. And she had seven kids, and my grandpa still tells me stories about how she would just make everything fun. She didn't let those things weigh her down. She was happy, and she would just play with her kids, and she would teach her kids about Jesus and about how much he loved them. She had influence over seven children. But what she didn't know is those seven children would grow up to start three churches, a ministry in Belize, and a school of ministry in Tanzania, and to send out ministers to every single continent on this planet. Do you think she knew that those seven kids would grow up to affect thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people? And that brings me to one of my points is that influence isn't always instant, and it isn't always obvious, and it's not always easy, and it's not always comfortable. But you have no idea what one act, one kind word, one moment could do in somebody's life. It could completely change everything for them. Pastor Mike had no idea what he was doing for me, just inviting me to his house to play ping pong and stuff at his house on a Saturday night. But it sowed seeds into me that are being harvested today. I had never even met my great-grandma Connie, but I'm still affected by the way that she lived her life. And so many are. 
And I think when we think about influence, we think about the wrong things because of the way that culture has defined it. Influence isn't somebody that has a platform. People always come before a platform. And I think whether you see it or not, you're an influencer. It might not be big. It might not be seen by everybody. But we might have... We just have people, we have friends, we have family, we all have influence over those people. And it's the people that are closest to us that make us feel like we matter that have the most influence over us. And in that way, every single one of you have influence. And and it's up to you. The real question is not whether you have influence. It's who are you influencing and what are you influencing them to. Man, some of you might be like, I don't think I can really influence people to Jesus. Like, if you knew about my life outside of these four walls, dude, like, it's bad. Like, I'm not ready. I don't think I can. I I don't think I can bring Jesus to people's lives. And to be honest with you, sometimes I think those same things about myself. I think, man, if you guys only knew some of the mistakes I made in my past and what I've been through and what I've done, man, Sometimes I don't feel worthy to be up here to be bringing this word to you. But then uh, God really reminded me of a story, and it's in John chapter 4. And as you're flipping over there, I'll just give you a little bit of context to this story. Um, Jesus was on a trip, and on this trip he decided to stop in Samaria, which was weird. And that's weird because Jews hated Samaritans, and Jesus was Jewish. And so nobody would have ever thought that Jesus would stop here because Jews hated Samaritans because they were half Jew, half Gentile, and Jews didn't believe that you should marry outside of the Jewish tradition. And so they hated these people. They avoided them at all costs. They thought that they were less than human. But Jesus, being um, a cultural, actually stepped into that place, and he he was at a well, and it was hot. It was the middle of the day. He wanted a drink. And so um, this woman came up, and she was drawing water from the well. And so he came up to her, and he's like, hey, can I get a drink? And this woman said, "Um, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Like, she was saying, like, why are you even talking to me? Like, you guys hate us. Not only that, like, I'm a woman, Like, people, men of that time didn't talk to women at all, especially a Samaritan woman. But then we see Jesus going out of his way to have a conversation with this woman. And he responds to her, and he responds to her in love, too, which probably was crazy to this woman. And he said, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me, him, and he would have given you living water. And then later in verse 16, it says this. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come he- to come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman says, sir, you must be a prophet. She's like, how do you know that? If we would think of this story in the context of today, can you imagine, like, if a woman had had five husbands, five divorces, and was living with a man that she isn't even married to now, the amount of judgment that she would face today would be crazy. Now you think of it in the context of back then, this lady was literally an outcast. Nobody wanted to talk to her. Nobody wanted to be around her. All the women would hide their husbands from her. And that's why she was actually drawing water in the middle of the day because she didn't want to see anybody. She didn't want to be seen. Because she knew that how they would treat her. But that's not what, the way Jesus treated her. He came to her and he was treating her with love. And he began to share just about some of the things that was going to come and that was going to happen. And she, she just engaged in a conversation with him. And she was like, and eventually led to, is like, yeah, I know the Messiah. I know he's coming. I know the Christ is coming. And I can't wait because he's going to answer all of our questions. And Jesus said, that's me. I am him. And that lady in faith, the most unlikely person to ever influence her town, being a total outcast, she dropped her jar of water and she left 
and she, said, and she went to the town and she said, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Can this be the one that we were praying for? Is this the Messiah? And they came out and they were coming to him. And in that story, Jesus witnessed to these people and they came to believe in him. And then for two days, Jesus stayed in that town and several, probably thousands of people came to know Jesus because of the act of one woman that was considered to be less than than everybody else, the least likely to ever influence, influence an entire town to come to Jesus. And my point with this story is that you don't have to be perfect to be an influencer. You don't serve out of your perfection. And if you're waiting to say, wait, I'll get it all together and then I'll share for Jesus, it's never going to happen. I'm not perfect. Nobody is perfect. God has actually used some of the things that I've messed up most in life to bring him glory. And if you step out and you start going to people and sharing to them about Jesus and sharing what he's doing in your life, despite your imperfections, he will use you. Because he doesn't use your perfection, he uses your willingness and your obedience. And just some more examples of people in the Bible that God used for his glory magnificently despite what they did. I mean, Moses was a murderer, and still he he used him to lead an entire nation out of Egypt. Rahab was a prostitute, still used mightily by God. David was a murderer and an adulterer, still used by God. I mean, he slept with another man's wife and then got that dude killed. He still was used for God. In fact, David is related to Jesus, and that's a part of his family, and still Jesus chose to be born into that family. It's not about perfection. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, and she was demon-possessed. Still, God loved her, called her, and she followed him and had an impact on the kingdom for him. Paul. Somebody who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament had probably one of the biggest impacts on us today, maybe probably right behind Jesus, is Paul, crazy, literally killed Christians for a living. That was his job. He went out and he killed Christians. God met him where, where he was at, changed his life, and used him for the glory of God. You do not be an influencer out of your perfection. God says, weakness, in your weakness, I am strong. If you submit to him, He's going to use the things that the devil tried to use against you for his glory. Don't wait to step out. You're meant to be used for God. You are an influencer. And how are you influencing people? And my challenge to you guys tonight is to walk in your identity. You are an influencer. The Bible says you're chosen and you're called. Matthew 5 says you are are the light of the world. You're salt. You're a city on the hill. And it only takes one moment to influence, to bring Jesus to somebody. What if the way that you worshipped started influencing the people around you? I'm going to tell you guys a story. Uh, When I was six years old, I was in VK. It was Pastor Gary Sweet. And we started going into a slow song of worship. And, uh, and I remember this kid, I don't even know who he is, still don't know who he is, uh, walked out of, like, our row and was just, like, standing over to the side. And he was just closing his eyes, and he was just, he was just worshiping. And he was singing to God, and, and that, like, totally blew me away because, like, I had never seen somebody my age worship like that. And so I was like, bro, that kid is, like, so weird. Like... <laughs> I wish I could say I was like, but no, I was like, dude, that kid is so weird. Like, why is he doing that? I didn't understand. But it planted a seed in my heart. I'm 22 years old. That was 16 years ago. I still remember it. And it still challenges my worship today. One little kid just worshiping genuinely. It still challenges me today. Let me tell you another story. I remember I was walking into church late one day, and I came in the back, and I remember looking over, and I I remember seeing this kid, and like instantly I was like, I know I'm supposed to talk to that kid, and I went down, I sat down, went through the service, and um, I remember I, I turned around, I was like looking for this kid, and I saw him walking away, so I was like, started chasing him out, 
I saw, like, he was going to the bathroom, so naturally I just followed him into the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, he was going pee, so I peed two, two stalls down. He got done. He washed his hands. I washed my hands. He walked out. I'm still following him. And there's, like, no way he didn't notice. Like, he definitely knew. I actually talked to this guy about this not too long ago, and he thought I was, like, the weirdest kid ever, just following him. And I followed him out, and I eventually caught him in the lobby. And, like, really weirdly, I just, like, grabbed him, and I was like, how old are you? <laughs> and he told me, and I was like, um, I actually thought, he, he looked really young, so I thought he was, like, 16, but he, uh, he was, like, 20, I think. And um, I was like, hey, uh, I don't know why, but God spoke to me about you, and I feel like you're really, like, you just need a good Christian friend group. And I was like, you know, do you want to, like, come hang out with us? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. You're a little weird, but yeah. <laughs> And um, that kid was Luis. And <laughs> give it up for Luis. Man, Luis is one of our leaders. He's one of my best friends. Man, he's here today, and it's just so cool. But, like, what if I decided not to do that? Where would, where would Luis be? Man, God has called you to influence you are an influencer. What would it look like if every one of you just went out and just got one friend to come here to youth next week? What would it look like if you just went up to that one weird kid and just like started talking to him and treating him like he was normal? Because I mean, like that's what Jesus did. He went to the lowest of the low. And so as I close, and I just hope that this message really encouraged and challenged you guys today. I just want to challenge you to be doers of the word. The word of God says that you are an influencer. You are chosen. You're called to be a city on a hill. And I hope that you guys leave today encouraged and challenged to go and find that one kid. Maybe there's an Alu a Luis for you guys or who knows. Uh, but I love you guys so much. I think we're going we're gonna to break out into small groups after this. I'm going to pray. Then we're going to have 7th and 8th grade over in um, the game room, senior high boys in here, and then we're going to have senior guy, high girls in the lobby. So if you guys could bow your head. Father, I just thank you so much for your word tonight. I pray that each and every student and leader would leave here encouraged, knowing that they're an influencer, that they have true influence over the people around them, and that they would leave challenging themselves with how they are influencing people and that they would decide to influence and call people to Jesus and know that it only takes one small moment to change somebody's life. In your name I pray, everybody said, amen, amen.